Hi, I'm here in Arl. This is like take three. Uh, I'm up against like a random wall, you see, because I want to be away from people. I don't know how vloggers do it, uh, how they just stand there and walk around with their other people. It makes me so immensely uncomfortable uh, that I really just cannot do it. Uh, maybe when I'm with people, I'll be able to do it, but certainly not. See, I can see someone over there and I'm afraid that I'm gonna look like a fucking kook just, you know, talking to my phone like this. Uh, anyways, oh yeah, he's walking this way. See, that's, that's really uncomfortable for me. Um, so I got here uh, a few hours ago. Uh, I drove here from uh, Les Beaux, uh, and I'm gonna be here for about two days or so. Uh, then I'll be heading up uh, back to Les Beaux probably, uh, see some more sites there. Um, this city is actually, the entire city is considered a UNESCO World Heritage Site just because of the sheer amount of Roman architecture that remains. I mean, they do say that if you want to see intact Roman architecture, you need to go to southern France and not Italy, and I'm pretty sure that's quite true. The thing about this city, though, unlike some other French cities like Saint-Rémy uh, and Les Beaux, for example, is that this is not a... it's not a, a richy tourist city. I mean, there are definitely pockets that are very much designated just for tourists, and you'll have lots of tourist shops and whatnot. But I mean, this is a very lived-in city. People just live here, they go here every single day for their jobs, and they can avoid the, the tourists uh, that just walk around everywhere near the amphitheater and whatnot. Uh, that's really unlike somewhere like Venice, which is incredibly rich, um, and it's impossible to get away from tourists because they just walk around in swarms. I think a lot of people get the impression when they go to a lot of these cities that to live here would just be to live in like a dream. Like, you know, you go to Venice and oh, it's just, it's wonderful and it's like magic or whatever. But if you were to live here and people who do live here, it's not always going to be a dream for them. There are some really poor communities uh, in this city and I think a lot of people, if they don't venture outside of the main tourist hub of Arles, will get the impression that everyone who lives here must be just living the dream. I think the, the idea that a city is all magical and whatnot comes from rich people going to rich areas in these cities. Uh, I think it's really important that people actually experience what it's like to live in a city like this, which means not getting a four or five star hotel, maybe stay in a hostel near the outsides of the city, uh, explore different communities, talk to the locals if you can. I mean, my French is okay, I can get by, I'll talk in English uh, when I'm able to because I'm just more comfortable with it. But yeah, yesterday I actually had a pretty incredible experience. I was uh, at a museum near the Alpilles, which is a, a mountain range just in southern Provence, which I did hike in a bit. Uh, it was an okay experience. I mean, beautiful sights, but holy shit, there's a lot of bugs. But I met a couple who were coming from America and were doing, and were tourists, and they were both archivists and one of them actually worked at Stanford uh, with the theoretical physicists doing some sort of data research and the data that they collected from I believe the LHC in Zurich but we had this whole conversation because she told me that they were going to visit the the grave or the memorial of Walter Benjamin and apparently it's not Walter Benjamin it's something like Walter Benjamin or something, the, the Jewish pronunciation of that, and I had no idea, so I feel like a total idiot now. Although everyone I talk to also says Walter Benjamin, so can't be too bad. Uh, but it got us talking, and one of the most important parts of Benjamin's work is the emphasis on historicity in, the, in, in just philosophy in general, and this importance to look at <clears throat> the development of philosophical ideas over time, rather than just trying to analyze every single concept and arrive at the truth. We should pay attention to philosophical history uh, and uh, understand that certain ideas are greatly influenced by the periods and the people that these philosophers worked around. And this is something that definitely went out of style a while back in analytic philosophy, probably in the 30s and the 40s, which was a complete abandonment of this historical approach to philosophy. And I mean, it probably starts with someone like Frege, who didn't give a damn about other people's ideas and just cut off every single previous philosophical methodology and philosophical idea that wasn't purely uh, justified through his analytic approach uh, and just completely dismiss them as 
uh, starting off on the wrong foot. But now you have philosophers like Michael Beanie, who I will hopefully be meeting with uh, in the next month, who are st starting this sort of uh, neo-historical approach within analytic philosophy that emphasizes the importance of tracing these ideas all the way back to their foundations and all the way back to their their uh, origins within history. And I think that's very important. He has a fantastic book called Making Sense, or Frege, colon, Making Sense. And you should definitely read it. I'm sure there's a PDF somewhere, but support the book because uh, I'm going to be meeting with him. But it, it definitely got me thinking uh, about this this basic division within analytic philosophy and with, within philosophy as a whole, but it's uh, you don't really have this approach within continental philosophy as far as I know about how much weight we should be putting on the social factors and the historical factors that uh, came into the discovery or investigation into these philosophical ideas, or if we should just completely ignore it and try to try uh, try to attempt to create a, a purely coherent and correct version of these ideas that these philosophers once tried to develop. So someone like Michael Dummett, who's one of my favorite philosophers, his book, Frege philosophy of language was a purely analytic take on that 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 kind of project. It he completely ignored, at least, well, this is what people claim. He has given some defenses in his later books, the interpretation of Frege's philosophy, as well as, as some uh, articles that he wrote arguing against uh, Hans Sluga and I think Gregory Curry. Uh, but it, he doesn't give background on Frege's roots. He doesn't talk about the late German idealists who influenced him, like Hermann Lotz and uh, Trendelenburg, and he doesn't look at uh, the influence of Kant on his uh, theory of analysis, which Beanie argues is really where Frege got his idea of analysis from. But, it, but it's all very, very interesting. And uh, again, this goes back to a sort of meta-philosophical question that I talked about in the last video, about what is the correct methodology under which we are to conduct ourselves. Do we want to completely isolate ourselves from these historical uh, influences and historical questions and purely look at the analysis and justification of these theories? Uh, or do we want to look at how these ideas were developed and analyze them within that context? Uh, I'll probably be posting another video today because this city is amazing and I want to I do want to show Some stuff. I just I don't have video editing software right now, so I'll work something out Anyways, hopefully you enjoyed this uh, if you liked it leave a comment. I love comments comments are fantastic uh, And yeah, have a good one. Adios